Filip Riker gosti na Balkanu skoro 20 godina. Profesionalni diplomata karijeru je počeo kao port parol u State Departmentu. Odnosom sa medijima bavio se nekoliko godina kao predstavnik State Departmenta, držao je predavanje i davao intervju o američkoj spojnoj politici i diplomatiji. Riker se prvi put približava Balkanu 90-ih u ambasadi u Budimpešti, bio je šef odnosa sa medijima. Riker je bio potom američki ambasador u Makedoniji od 2008. do 2011. već godinu i po u State Departmentu zadužen je za pitanje Balkana. Riker važi za dobrog poznavoca prilika u ovom dijelu Evrope. Crnugoru zadnji put je posjetio u maju ove godine. Mr. Riker, you were here in Montenegro last time in May and actually this is your second visit in Montenegro in six months so I don't mean to sound rude but is this a good thing or a bad thing in a political sense? Well for me it's a, a pleasure to visit Montenegro. I uh, work with seven countries uh, in South Central Europe uh, as part of the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs at the State Department and uh, Secretary Clinton asked uh, that I visit Podgorica uh, as soon as I could after your elections and after our elections and it was a great opportunity to have a full day of meetings in Podgorica uh, starting with Prime Minister Luksic. I met with the Foreign Minister, with the Defense Minister, with the Justice Minister and of course with Milo Djukanovic who will soon become your uh, Prime Minister again. And I met uh, with the Speaker of Parliament uh, and of course with our Embassy team, uh, Ambassador Brown and uh, our team of professional diplomats who were here on the ground in Montenegro all the time. You were here, as I said, in May. Now elections are over in Montenegro. We have uh, the new prime minister, who is Mr. Djukanovic. Do you think that, uh, and you know the situation in Balkans very good, so do you think that Montenegro with old politicians in power is going forward or backward? Well, first, let me congratulate uh, Montenegro and all the citizens of Montenegro on successful elections. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, you had elections, we had elections in the United States, uh, and I think both of those elections were, were very good. Here in Montenegro, you had a very high turnout. Uh, they were successful elections. They were deemed free and fair. That's a very positive step for a country uh, that is uh, young, as Montenegro is, in a, a neighborhood that over the last two decades has seen so much change. Uh, and uh, development of, of democracy and, and free market. Uh, and the U.S. government, of course, is very proud uh, to be a partner with Montenegro. That's why it's uh, always a pleasure for me to come here and visit, to uh, exchange views and ideas with uh, our counterparts here. Um, and we will continue to uh, work closely with uh, whatever government is elected by uh, the Montenegrin people. Uh, we know uh, Milo Djukanovic very well. Of course, he has served as your prime minister before. Uh, and he's someone who I have uh, met with many times. Uh, I consider him a friend because uh, he has very good insights uh, on the whole region. And so uh, I met with him in May. I met with him on earlier visits to get his views. Uh, he's a strategic thinker. Uh, and clearly, the, uh, the people of Montenegro, uh, in casting their, their votes, uh, have registered a degree of confidence uh, in him and uh, the formation of a new government is still underway and as I told uh, Mr. Djukanovic and uh, uh, ministers who are currently uh, in power, uh, we look forward to continuing our strong partnership. So actually when you meet with Mr. Djukanovic, you, not, you don't talk only about Montenegro, you talk about regional issues as well. I, I appreciate his views on the whole region very much, mm -hmm. obviously uh, he has been uh, an important political figure uh, in the region for two decades or more. Uh, and so as I do in all of the capitals I visit, uh, I try to come uh, with a regional perspective uh, to talk about our bilateral relationship, but also look at the regional perspective. And of course, uh, part of that is uh, Euro-Atlantic integration, mm -hmm. which is uh, the key point of our policy for the whole region. So did you talk about joining Montenegro, joining NATO with Mr. Djukanovic and the other ministers you met today? Obviously, uh, uh, you know, Montenegro has had a policy uh, aimed at uh, becoming a member of NATO. Already, uh, Montenegro is a strong partner with NATO. We work together in uh, ISAF, of course, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, with common goals there, uh, working shoulder to shoulder, our soldiers, uh, along with uh, other partners and allies. 
I think that's been a very successful uh, mission and uh, we appreciate very much Montenegro's participation in that. Montenegro has long been uh, active uh, through our state partnership program, uh, partnering with uh, the National Guard from uh, the state of Maine in the United States. And I think that can have a very positive effect on our military to military relationship, but also a civilian dimension in that. And those partnerships, those state partnerships have been very effective throughout this region. And so uh, we very much support uh, Montenegro's uh, aspiration to uh, join NATO. Uh, Secretary Clinton underscored that at the uh, summit uh, last spring in Chicago. And we will continue to uh, work with Montenegro in that direction. This is on the high political level. And it's not a, it's not a secret that Montenegro and poli high level politicians are willing to join NATO. But on the field or in, on the ground, only one third of Montenegrin citizens are actually in favor of joining NATO, you think that those numbers are boring? Well, I think what's important is to look at the experience of other countries uh, in the region uh, and to uh, make an effort to understand what the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is all about. I would suggest, as do many, that in fact NATO has been one of the most successful uh, alliances in maintaining peace uh, for the entire time of its existence. Uh, since uh, the end of World War II and the formation of NATO in, in 1949, uh, peace in Western Europe uh, has led to prosperity of unimagined dimension. Uh, countries uh, who a century ago one would not have expected could work together uh, have been allies. No two NATO countries have ever gone to war against each other. Uh, and so I think it's been a very successful alliance and the expansion of the alliance beginning in, in 1999 uh, has also been very successful. So if you look at uh, the experience of uh, Hungary, of, of Poland, of uh, the countries in the Baltic region, of Croatia, uh, I think uh, there are many right here in the neighborhood who have seen that NATO uh, gives you a, a level of security, of stability, uh, and of confidence. U.S. policy has been to, uh, to leave the door to NATO membership open to any country that is uh, desiring of that. Montenegro has pursued that policy and uh, we very much uh, believe that as people come to understand what NATO uh, offers, uh, what it's about, uh, people will also see that it is a, a positive track for Montenegro. However, these figures and these numbers don't, don't change in time. Let me rephrase my question. Should go the government be worried about these figures? Well, I think these are, are issues, again, for, for Montenegro. Uh, uh, NATO helps boost confidence uh, of foreign investors. Uh, it is um, a fact that no country is pressuring Montenegro to join NATO. It's a decision that uh, Montenegro needs to take for itself. Uh, we've discussed uh, NATO membership and the uh, great efforts that Montenegro has made, the reforms in the military, uh, doing very well on the, on the NATO uh, path that was uh, reiterated at the uh, Chicago summit. The final decision lies with Montenegro and with its uh, citizens. And uh, we will always continue to be a partner of Montenegro and support Montenegro in the direction it wants to go. If Montenegro wants to join NATO, Montenegro has to get an invitation for joining NATO. And th there are some speculation saying that we could get that ticket or invitation in two years. However, do you think that we will get the invitation in case the numbers remain so low? Well, I think uh, NATO and, and uh, invitations for membership are based on meeting certain criteria, mm -hmm. undertaking reforms, uh, meeting a set of standards uh, that have been common for all those who have joined the alliance. Uh, and Montenegro will be held to the same standard. Uh, that is what uh, the membership will be based upon. So I think it's better to talk about uh, reforms and standards uh, and principles, uh, common uh, values that are shared by members of the alliance uh, and work towards that rather than talking about dates. When you say about standards, do you mean also about the rule of law, fight against corruption? Is that also linked to NATO? and? to NATO standards? Absolutely. I mean, NATO, as I said, is uh, very much about a shared set of values. Uh, 
Uh, all members of NATO are, are democracies. Throughout this region now, you have democracies. Montenegro is a democracy and, of course, needs to continue working on a number of reforms. Uh, NATO and the European Union, the European Commission, uh, issue annual reports that evaluate progress mm -hmm. on those reforms. And those are very positive tools uh, that your leadership can use to uh, evaluate where more work needs to be done. Some progress has been made uh, in Montenegro and in other countries in the region, and of course there's still more to be done. When you say some progress, can you tell me what do you have in mind? Well, I think we've seen uh, strengthening in uh, the criminal procedure code, strengthening uh, in rule of law. There have been uh, uh, active legislative uh, measures taken uh, in, in this regard and more needs to, to be done. It's a continuous effort. We certainly know that in the United States. We don't have all the answers uh, in the United States, but we perhaps have uh, far many more years of experience in uh, dealing with these issues, in uh, working through legislation and regulation to fight crime, corruption, uh, to bring rule of law to be uh, uh, level so that there's a confidence uh, for investors who know that they are facing a level playing field in terms of the legal environment in which they work and are willing to invest their money and that's positive for economic growth. But when you talk with common people on the street they will tell you that they don't feel all the good things Montenegro has done until now. You know when, when you talk with somebody on the street they don't actually feel all the change, changes in the legal system. What would you, what would you say to those people? Well, I think uh, some people should uh, step back and take a look where you have come. You know, I, I spend so much time in the Balkans uh, and I'm used to people often having a very negative attitude. Uh, pessimism permeates. Uh, and I think if you step back and think about where Montenegro was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I just take a look as a visitor who comes to Podgorica to see uh, the progress. Uh, there's a lot more to be done and people have high expectations and, and they're they're right to have expectations. They should want the most out of their society uh, and their opportunities. That's certainly what Americans want. We're never fully satisfied. Uh, but think about where this region was 100 years ago in the midst of the Balkan Wars leading up to World War I. It was a time when the people of this region had very little say over their futures or their lives when uh, these wars were carried out by uh, old empires, uh, great power, politics and games. Now, every one of the countries in this region is a democracy where citizens have rights. Citizens choose their leaders through th free and fair elections. And those leaders are then responsible to their citizens. So really things have come a long, long way and I think there's a, a level of stability, uh, security in Montenegro uh, that can be matched by levels of prosperity uh, if you continue on the reform path. And we believe that the Euro-Atlantic uh, institutions, NATO, the European Union, represent uh, the best that can be offered in terms of uh, a brighter future. When we talk about Montenegro, we have to talk also about the Balkans, which was uh, in the world news coverage these days because of the sentence in the ICTY regarding two Croat generals. And that sentence actually sparked the same pictures and the same feeling we could see 20 years ago. Was that sentence for you a surprise? Well, we noted the judgment. And the reactions as well. We noted the, uh, the judgment uh, of the appeals chamber from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, that is a, uh, a tribunal that was created by the United Nations in order to uh, deal with uh, the issues that arose from the horrific things that uh, happened uh, in recent decades in this part of the world. The focus here has to be on reconciliation. And uh, judgments are made uh, on the basis of, of laws and analysis uh, and, and those judgments need to be respected, but we also need to be able to move on and look to the future. And uh, I think uh, it's always a mistake to get too caught up uh, in, in the past. Uh, there's great opportunity ahead for all the people of this region. I think uh, if you step back uh, and try to step away from the emotional aspects of this, you can see uh, that a process of national reconciliation has to take place. 
That's what uh, the European perspective is all about. That's what NATO is all about, is reconciliation. Think of where Europe, the entire continent, was in 1945. And look how far people have come in terms of uh, reconciling uh, old enemies, finding that they have much more in common when they work together on a set of common values. Uh, and I think that's very possible here in the Balkan region as well. So, were you surprised with the sentence? I think people realize, uh, well, they have emotional reactions uh, to these things, and, and people are entitled to their views and opinions. You know, uh, justice does not always appear uh, balanced to all. Uh, and so the, uh, the judges uh, on this uh, UN tribunal have to make decisions based on, on the knowledge and the, the cases before them. Uh, and that's not going to make everyone happy. What's important is that we learn to move forward, to think about reconciliation, to think about what is going to give ourselves a better future, all of us, uh, and not as much focusing uh, on the past. When, you, when we talk about region, where do you see the weak parts of the region? Weak. Oh, I prefer to focus on the strengths. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, this region has so much to offer. Uh, and if you take a look, as I suggested, over the past 20 years or the past 100 years and how far this region has come, U.S. policy uh, has always been, since 1945, uh, to see a Europe whole, free, at peace, democratic, and increasingly prosperous. And there is absolutely no reason uh, that all of the people of this region cannot enjoy uh, those same goals, uh, to share the same values, uh, to have uh, opportunities uh, to raise their families so that their children and grandchildren can have better futures. And I think that's what we've tried to create. You know, the world is a difficult place. There are great challenges, uh, not just here uh, in the Balkans or in Europe, but all over the world. Secretary Clinton demonstrates that. Uh, the issues that uh, we in the United States are, are dealing with, the Secretary herself involved, uh, whether it's traveling uh, to help bring a ceasefire in, in Gaza, uh, the Middle East peace process to which uh, President Obama is so committed, uh, dealing with Iran and the threats of their nuclear program, unrest in Syria, the so-called Arab Spring that has uh, taken so much attention in the world over the past couple of years, uh, broader issues like global warming. I mean, there are a lot of issues in the world because we all share this same planet. Uh, sure, but and and that's what we have to, have to, uh, to focus on. Excuse me for interrupting no. you, but anyway, when you talk with, uh, when you are here in Montenegro, Montenegrins are only worried about their future. So uh, we often hear that Montenegro is a good example, as you said, in the region. Is it always like that? Or there are, are there any countries which are better, maybe, in some parts than Montenegro? Oh, I always stay away from trying to, uh, to compare one mm -hmm. or another. Uh, you know, a country is made up of its citizens. And it's how the citizens feel about their country. The United States is very proud to be a partner with Montenegro. We were very pleased to see uh, Montenegro make the progress it has since uh, you regained your independence. And it's a strong history that you have. And, and uh, at this time, when we look back over the past century, uh, there is a lot of history. And if you think about uh, the progress that Montenegro has made, even in recent years, I think it's really uh, something for everyone to be proud of. More importantly, though, there's always more that can be done. And you can have a great future ahead of you. And the United States wants to support you in whatever future uh, you see for yourselves. We want to keep open the doors of Euro-Atlantic integration. We're very pleased with the partnership that we have. We want to continue supporting uh, Montenegro uh, as a friend um, to the extent that, that you want us here and involved with you. And our embassy is very dedicated to that. You have an active ambassador and embassy in Washington. I'm very pleased to be able to uh, work with Ambassador Germanovic on a regular basis, and I think uh, working together, one very small country, Montenegro, and one very big country, the United States, we actually have a lot in common. Thank you so much, Mr. Riker. Thank you. Thank you.